Hello, I'm Heather Lockett, and this is Lasting Conversations. Brooke Sternberg is with us today. She is a full-spectrum doula, energy therapist, and co-founder and president of the Doula's Care Collective. Her business name is Aspired Mother. Hi, Brooke. Hi. Oh, I'm so happy that you are here. You are birthing babies. You are assisting families do their thing, and I'm very happy that we have connected here. Very much. And um, so tell us about what a doula is. And and I say that because, interestingly, um, many of our generations have forgotten what a doula is, or even a midwife, Mm -hmm. um, and the difference between a doula and a midwife, if there is any. Yeah. So tell us about that. So a doula is essentially a birth companion. We focus on providing informational support. So science-based, in many cases, evidence-based, especially if you're in a hospital setting dealing with clinicians, they're coming from that perspective. And so ultimately, when I say informational support, we're providing benefits, risk, what are the alternatives to the plethora of medical interventions that go on in a birth Mm -hmm. experience. Uh, We also provide emotional support physical support. So as doulas, we bring the physiology into the birth space. Many doctors today and nurses are not trained enough in the physiology of birth. And so as doulas, we're trained to really bring that level of awareness to moms and their partners of what needs to occur for baby in the pelvis to engage and what kind of positioning needs to occur to help the baby move further down the birth canal with as minimal tearing, minimal trauma, ultimately. That's just beautiful. And these days, especially in the the medical community, they're so busy. They're literally physically, not to mention emotionally busy, Mm -hmm. to spend time to go that extra mile with the mom and her family. Um, So tell us about your experiences. Um, And actually, my question is shifting as we're unscripted here into, do you do home births or that's a whole nother area of, basically it comes down to choice Mm -hmm. and engaging with each family and each mom Mm -hmm. to understand what it is that they're, that they need medically, physically, emotionally. So share some of your, your beautiful wisdom there. So, um, well, I think the first thing I want to finish is just answering the original question in terms of what's the difference between doulas and midwives, and then I'll kind of bring me into this next part. Um, so as doulas, like I said, it's informational, physical, and emotional, and sometimes in many ways it's spiritual. Birth is um, has always been a sacred experience, a rite of passage, um, and in a modern society we've kind of left that. Right. Um, And so when it comes to what's the difference between doulas and midwives, midwives are clinical. So they are handling everything below the belt and doulas focus more on the psychosocial aspect, providing the information so that mom and partner feel informed, they feel empowered. Um, You can look at midwives, midwifery is a a higher level of nursing. So many midwives in a, well, in a hospital setting, they're RNs Mm -hmm. who had gone through the additional training to be a midwife in a non-hospital setting, whether it's a birth center or a home birth, you have two parts in the state of Florida. You have a licensed midwife where she may have been a doula prior and worked her way into being a birthing assistant, which is kind of in between a doula and a midwife. And they're more on the clinical side as a nurse, as an assistant supporting the midwife when she's at your birth. Mm -hmm. And then you have, um, so let me go back quickly. So you have a licensed midwife, you have a certified nurse midwife, which is in a hospital setting, but also in out of hospital setting. Mm-hmm. So there's three levels of midwifery, but it's ultimately clinical care. And then you have the obstetricians who primarily are trained surgeons. Mm-hmm. And so many moms go into birth not recognizing that when they go in towards a hospital birth, they're working with clinicians who are trained to perform surgery. And here in Palm Beach County, we have a very high number of cesarean rates Mm -hmm. and unfortunately a very high rate of inductions. Mm -hmm. And it's, as a doula, you're an advocate. You're advocating for their overall well-being. 
And in many cases, uh, providers look at it as, at the end of the day, a healthy baby is what matters. From my perspective, let's not dismiss the mother's psyche. Very interesting. Because, dot, 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 I I don't want to fill yeah. in the blank no, here, but, yeah. but really tell us more about that from from your working with these families and these moms. And, you know, yeah. we've heard of postpartum, um, mm-hmm. things don't go as easily as we might imagine. Right. And our bodies, there's hormones, there's sleep deprivation, there's so much. So the support that you can also give is invaluable. Um, so from that, I have a two pronged mm-hmm. question. One is while you're in a hospital setting, working with obstetricians, mm-hmm. And that, how do they, are they happy that you're there? Mm-hmm. Are they happy for the help? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes and no. Okay. So it depends on their experience. Right. We have, a, you know, a, the. And are there certain hospitals yeah, actually that yeah. are more open to these services? The business of, of doula work, of mm-hmm. birth work, um, and, and, the history of doula, it, women have been beside women since the dawn of time, supporting, whether it was their women in the tribe, their mothers, their sisters, their aunties, their grandmothers, women of wisdom, women who have gone through birth before them mm-hmm. to hold their hand and to support since them. Since literally the dawn of time. Right. This is not new science. Not new. This is nothing new. But let's say here in the United States in the last 30 years, doula work mm-hmm. became more and more of a thing. Mm-hmm. In the 70s, we had a huge movement of natural birth. Mm -hmm. And then we got into uh, father coaching, Mm -hmm. which more commonly is known as like the Bradley method, Mm -hmm. which is really preparing the father to be that birth coach. And then we really had this next influx of cesareans. So that's interesting that at at one hand, things became more natural and inclusive Mm-hmm. And then at the same time that it also got more hospitalized and clinical. Business. I find that very fast. Business. Oh, okay. More business. Right? So I think there's like this. It's very interesting to me. It's very fascinating. Interconnectedness it's with very, just how yeah. our society has evolved in the last 30 years. And do you find that similar across the world in other countries? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Same, the same dynamic of natural and cesarean? My understanding is yes and no. So I, I, I've learned that in our society today, there is such a disconnection with our bodies as women. Our mortality rates are some of the highest in the world. Mm. When it comes to maternal care, we're almost like a third world country. That alone Sometimes we forget that. We do. And that impacts- Within our society, across the different cultures within the United States, that maternity and birthing can still be pretty darn dangerous Mm -hmm. across the board. And as a full spectrum doula, I'm not only supporting parents through birth, but through adoption, through abortion, through postpartum, which- is my my heart and my passion is in that postpartum period. Mm. Even if a mother were to go through a miscarriage, mm-hmm. to some capacity, every woman is so unique and different, but at some capacity, she's grieving. Mm-hmm. She's bereaving. And she's still a mom. She's still a mom. She's still a mom. And what, what to do with that? And that is kind of where I came into this is because I suffered three miscarriages and for a very long time didn't realize I was grieving. And it wasn't until... My sister passed away a few years ago where I kind of came into awareness through my own therapy of recognizing I was already grieving. And now I was on top of that, grieving the loss of my sister and really recognizing through her loss um, how impactful it is to have a companion that is not focused on the clinical care of managing right. the care of the one who was passing, the mm-hmm. one who's birthing, mm-hmm. but just being able to hold space, to hold her hand, to be in that present space. And in my approach, um, I my, my goal is to give that birthing experience, to give it an experience. Um, I was at a birth this weekend and it was, you know, the nurses said it was very Zen-like. 
You were so excited when we, we tapped in yeah. yesterday to, to schedule time and you said it was just magical. tears of joys and, and magical. Yeah. What was it specifically do you feel? I think what is the most touching thing is witnessing a woman's strength and courage through birth, through natural birth. Mm -hmm. This was a mom who is a planner in nature. An A personality. A personality. A type. Mm -hmm. A type. Really wanted a home birth. In our prenatal sessions together, was really not wanting to go into talking about medical interventions because that doesn't exist in home birth. Mm -hmm. In an out of hospital birth, you're not dealing with the management of care. That's the beauty of midwifery, was that we are more guides, observants. We are there to witness the sacredness, the power that a woman has in reconnecting to her body, mm -hmm. trusting her body, and working with her baby to give birth. And when you go into a hospital setting, we are so involved disrupting the natural rhythm of birth. And know that, okay, this is not, this is not in the book, right. and this is not according to plan. Right. But welcome to motherhood. Welcome to motherhood. <laughs> exactly. And get ready, because none of it, right. <laughs> there are no books for what's about to happen right. to and your whole life. I say that in, in some laughter, because oh, it of is. Of course, because it's welcome ridiculous. To welcome to parenthood. So <laughs> This is day one. <laughs> right, 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 right. And for her... Being a planner and, and, and not wanting to go there, but I did kind of go in a direction that she didn't want to go to, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. But in her case, she was 41 weeks and two days mm -hmm. when her plans changed. Mm -hmm. She was past full term. Right. She was thinking she was smooth sailing right into a home birth. But her body and her baby and her had to learn how to be open to the unexpected, the right. unknown. Mm -hmm. And in her case, she was just losing a little too much fluid mm -hmm. that the midwives felt like it was safer in a hospital environment. And she, you know, went through, we talk about the benefits and the risks and the alternatives, what's her intuition saying and what happens if we do nothing. Mm -hmm. So we ended up having a birth at the birth or at the hospital and she had a great um, hospital staff and everybody was on board. And I'm very, I'm a planner too. I did she have to be induced? Was yes. Well, she see, did. that was part of the huge switch, wasn't very it? Much, she very needed much. to be induced. Um, but we're very thorough um, with our birth plans. And um, it takes a while as a doula to really trial and error. Welcome to parenthood. Mm -hmm. uh, you're learning as you go along. And, you know, it, it, it my approach is it's all about being a team. It's not us against them. Mm -hmm. And so kind of going back to answering your question about OBs or clinicians and what's their reaction to doulas, it's, it, it's dependent on their experience. There are many OBs who have worked with doulas who are very protective and it's very hard not to be. Sure. You're in a space and you are um, mama bear mm -hmm. protecting her young mm -hmm. and it's important to you to see that her birth plan at some aspect of it is honored right and so in her case she was having a home birth so the the birth center that she was working with already are connected to ob's so her ob it came in with a very different um energy mm-hmm um, but in my nature, it's protecting that space. And so I come in and I, depending on the mom and this mom was into her crystals and we set up an altar and we, um, she brings in the led lights, her little candles. And I have a projector that, um, projects ultimately the stars and the moon up in the ceiling. We keep the lights off and we put on whether it's Reiki music or something very tranquil or hypnobirth affirmations and you walk into this birth room and you're not, you're at a spa. Nice. It's experience. Nice. I mean, doesn't she deserve that? Of course. Well, and the child, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. In the babies themselves. Yeah. So keep on going. This is beautiful. Um, so in the note for OBs and nurses, it really is just dependent on their experiences. Some doulas come in with their own birth experiences. And what I feel is unique and different for me is that 
even though I've gone through these miscarriages and many layers of it, of giving birth, mm-hmm. miscarrying is still in my mind, birth. Mm-hmm. You still need to be honored, celebrated and taken care of. Right. Um, just as if you gave birth to a full term baby. Um, <clears throat> but many of us who are doulas have our own birth experiences and unfortunately, maybe some birth trauma that we're still processing out of our own. And many of us are very strong one way or another. Works for them. But for me, in my experience, and my journey into birth work, I don't come in with biases. Mm-hmm. So it really is like, what is it that they want? Even if at the end of the day, they wanted an epidural or a cesarean is what they felt was best for them. Right. As long as they are informed, they know the risks, the benefits, the alternatives. I ask them, what is your intuition? I want you to feel confident in your decision making. Right. I want you to have the autonomy that you desire. I want there to be a level of shared decision making so that it's not just the doctor making decisions for you. That strips away the mother's sense of feeling safe in her decisions, feeling safe in her body. And I want to protect that because if we walk out those hospital doors and you did not have an opportunity to consent, to agree to how it unfolded in terms of intervention, how are you going to go out there and mother and feel confident in the decisions that you're making? Well, this is where um, I like what you're saying about the choices and the decision ahead of time as much as we can. Yeah. And I had a conversation with someone over the weekend that said, we ultimately, it came down to, well, what is fear versus prudent, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have certain symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. What is prudent to cancel something that is social and what would be Mm fear-based? And so you're, you're getting all goosebumpy. So the same thing with giving birth, informed decisions, and that reliance on your team. And so, because things really can happen medically. And so afterwards, so if something does happen and the mom it becomes unconscious or she has to mm-hmm. have a surgery or something else happens, that that's okay. There is grace in that as well. Totally. There is absolute grace in all of these scenarios. Mm-hmm. And so that feels like, the next stage that you pick up on is afterwards. Whatever their story is, whatever has happened Mm -hmm. is still beautiful. People are in car accidents or people have just all kinds of scenarios. Their heart gives out and, you know, the medical establishment is a beautiful thing and it's here for a reason. And all but best laid plans can go haywire. But then it also sounds like the rest of your work comes into play to have those spaces of grace to remind the mom of their strength and their courage. And so tell, tell us that part of the journey, the afterwards, Mm -hmm. Um, especially if it hasn't gone so, yeah, so beautifully and magically. Every birth is magic. Literally every birth is magic. Every single single time, every single time. Mm -hmm. So to further your birth and you have prenatal prenatal care before you came in, you had a whole session with someone Mm -hmm talking about her prenatal care, Mm -hmm. which again is something that has shifted in the medical community. There's like, here are your vitamins and I'll see you next month. Right. So tell us about the beginning and the after. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that those are the two parts that we have yet to really tap into in our South Florida community. Okay. Like truly. Right. Um, A lot of medic and kind of jumping around here, but Medicaid offers doula support. Great. We have a lot of insurance companies down here in Florida who provide that support. That's fantastic. Cover the cost of a doula. Good. So when a woman says, I don't know if I can afford it, call your insurance company. Why? Um, I think every mom deserves a chance at having a doula because it's all about preparation. Even in the conversation, just have a conversation. Yeah. Just have a conversation, yeah. right? Call a doula, ask her questions, mm-hmm. interview plenty of doulas as mm-hmm. much as you can find until you find the right one. I believe that, um, you know, there is a doula for every family. I, as a doula, may not be right for every family, but there is definitely a doula for every family. And I want to celebrate that even in the doula community. 
because I think that we all have our own magic, our own gifts that we bring to the table. Right. Um, if you're not, um, if you're not certain of how your anxiety can be managed, having a doula is really great. I mean, I tend to attract more. I, mean, I even work with mental health therapists who mm-hmm. go through labor, and they're even surprised. They've done a lot of their own internal work, and yet things come up unexpectedly in birth. Right. Even in terms of just um, our childhood experiences, our own birth story, our own relationships, um, the relationship with the mother wound is huge in birth. Um, so going back to prenatal, we spend a lot of time together talking about all kinds of things. It's not just uh, labor positions. Mm-hmm. It's not just breathing. Uh, those are important, but there's a lot of deeper things that we need to talk about. Communication, relationships, your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your body. Um, how are you managing your own emotional well-being? Mm-hmm. Um, breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is such an important thing. That is a whole other show. I'm sure there are other even podcasters that totally. that is specifically. That's totally. a whole lactation. That yeah. is its own science and yeah. spirit walk. Mm-hmm. and practicality. Very much. That's a whole thing. And those are things that need to be just talked about mm-hmm. prenatally. So, Well, and because there is what we call the Bible that came out, I won't, I actually, I can't remember the name of it, but we know which one it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, what to expect. And that has been the, a beautiful Bible. I read mine in 1992. Within that, though, starts seeping in guilt factors because if we haven't followed it to mm-hmm. and it's there are more more than that book it's more yes. than that book yes. but i think we know what we're saying yeah. when the some of the information that we're receiving feels i have to do it this way and i have to do it this way then we have these guilt factors totally. that we haven't done it this way including well, I can't breastfeed or it's just not working, but that doesn't make me a bad mother. Mm-hmm. I'm having a cesarean. I'm having this. I'm ha- I asked for medication. That does also does not make me a bad mother. And that is not going to be a detriment to my child because afterwards there are ways that we can help all of that. And sometimes even the child, well, now we're going to touch mm-hmm. on this. The kids know what they're doing. The mm-hmm. kids coming <laughs> through their mom from the cosmos, Mm -hmm. have in their own way chosen this. So all the feelings right now, because it's so true. (laughs) It is very true. And it gives a mother grace just knowing that it's not up to her to control the outcome. And as you just mentioned about welcome to parenthood, Mm -hmm. and I'm a a fixer in recovery (laughs) 101, and the kids are the best teachers, (laughs) is to guide but we don't, we're not there to control them. They are their own sovereign being mm-hmm. selves. And even in especially tiny wee infants, Very much. They, they just are. Um, they come with so many lessons for us to learn. I was talking to my mom last night and we were talking about um, parenting and just realizing myself with, I'm a bonus mom and the girls are, nine and 11 Mm -hmm. and I've been in the picture since the little one was two Mm -hmm. and even though they are not biologically mine they fill me with so many lessons Mm -hmm. of my own childhood and I was saying to my mom last night god like it's talk about reparenting and I always say that to my family is like just coming from my perspective um, really learning to surrender in the birth journey. I mean, I look at it as labor land. When we go through <laughs> labor land, labor I land, and I talk about this mythical story of Inanna, or many people know her as Persephone. Okay. Right. And it's this mythical story about going into the underworld and she has to cross these gates and at every gate she has to leave something behind. And then symbolically, that is what a woman does. She has to leave very specific aspects of who she is in maidenhood Mm -hmm. behind. And she comes out as a new mother, a newborn mother in many ways. And as she comes through postpartum, she gains things like wisdom, courage, grace, 
And so when I talk about birth being magical, being a witness of that, every time I cry, I go, I either cry, I always say to them, if you see me crying, I can't help it. I'm a woman Mm -hmm. and I've just seen the most courageous thing you've ever done in your life. And I always tell them, like, no matter what the outcome is, like, you are so courageous, even in making that hard decision to, to terminate your baby, to choose to have a cesarean, to find acceptance in having an emergency cesarean. Mm-hmm. No matter what the reason is, you are so courageous for what you just went through. And I encourage in prenatally for dads to recognize and celebrate that. We need that from our men Mm -hmm. to be able to see our strength. It changes the dynamic in their relationship when he can see in those times of helplessness, because our men are our fixers, they're the the problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And natural birth, you can't solve problems. Right. And they have to stand back sometimes depending on their nature And embrace helplessness, Mm -hmm. but with my guidance, it's involving them through it. So sometimes in this case, this mom's husband um, did all the preparation he needed to do, and he was her birth coach, but he was this week uh, encapsulating her placenta. And I always say to him, like, you're going to be that dad who I talk about till the end of time because go you. Like (laughs) (laughs) That's next level. Many dads don't, right, it's next next level, level, but- their level of participation and involvement really makes the experience. Right. Because that's what I'm selling is an experience. Mm-hmm. I want you to have the most positive, satisfying birth experience that I can possibly help you have, mm-hmm. even in the event of having all these medical interventions. Right. There's some way somehow that we can make it magical, whether it's just the lighting or the candles or putting tape over the light switch so that they're not coming in, turning on and off the lights. Because that disrupts her orientation. Birth is so sensory. And I have sensory issues, Mm -hmm. if you want to call them issues. But um, it's very much sensory. So it's sight, sound, smell, touch. Right. And so if we can protect that, it really changes the way that they both experience. I mean, it changes the way that nurses come into the room. And they're always like, wow. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah. Even in a hospital space, you can make it. A beautiful experience. Oh, of course. You know, we can, we can shift the energy anywhere really. And just make that conscious effort. Totally. And in a cesarean, in an OR, um, if you, I mean, even if you're having a natural birth at home or at a birth center, I still will have you go through and we'll talk about a cesarean birth, the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And we call it a gentle cesarean. Right. I want it to make it as humane as possible. So let's talk about, Lighting, or no, I'm sorry, lighting, uh, music. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about prayer. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your senses, sense of smell, sight, sound. So are you listening to meditation? Are you listening to your affirmations? Do you want to be involved? Right. I just saw somebody post about a gentle, I don't know if it was you, I don't think, was that you? That there's actually a a different kind of a tenting Mm -hmm. so that the mom can see she was able to actually visibly be seeing mm-hmm. the whole cesarean process. And it comes down to the OB, mm-hmm. the anesthesiologist. So this is the team. If you create the best team scenario, mm-hmm. you know, there you go. That is that is the best outcome. Um, and talk about the partners a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I am very glad to know a couple of women who are now moms, mutual mm-hmm. moms. And so, and, and of course, so many families of so many flavors yeah. of not just mom and dad, but we're doing there's the surrogacy. There's so many different flavors of birth and there's, well, I won't get into that, mm-hmm. but there's another baby coming who is literally a miracle baby because just there are ways, there are ways of melding modern medicine, a lot of good energy, prayer work, mm-hmm. divine timing, mm-hmm. And laying a path and then the children who want to come, the spirit of the child that wants to come. So go ahead and fly with that a little bit. And because we're a next generation, the kids that are, every child is special. And from your work, 
what are you feeling? Because you were lighting up completely just talking about the yeah. kids and communicating with them before they're even here. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a few, um, there are a few great books out there <clears throat> talking about spirit babies. And there are some great wise women. I call them the elders of our community. Mm -hmm. uh, midwives, for the most sense, midwives that um, are very connected to that. A lot of me mediums out there who work with moms and being able to connect to their babies. Mm -hmm. um, I lit up about that because, um, one, reading these books, but two, having more and more moms who are curious about that coming into my world and allowing me the opportunity to be curious with them mm -hmm. about it and allowing that curiosity to just come through. Um, <clears throat> from my approach, I do spend a lot of time talking to parents about their babies, um, more from being mindful of their nervous system. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about sensory and you're a newborn coming into this world and the dynamic in a hospital space is you have all these bright lights. Mm -hmm. You have all the coldness, the touch, the, all of these things are growing neural pathways in their mind and their memory. And if a mom comes out of post, <clears throat> out of birth, out of her birth experience with some level of postpartum trauma or depression, that directly impacts the well being of the baby. Mm -hmm. um, so, my background in postpartum care is in um, Ayurveda, and Ayurveda. In Vedic scripture, they talk about there's this huge sacredness in, in postpartum care and support. And they look at the overall well-being of the mother impact has a direct impact on the baby. Um, they be, The belief is that within the first 42 days, her overall well-being will directly impact the next 42 years of her life. So if she's not tended to and cared for, how does that impact not only her physical well-being, her emotional well-being, but her relationship with her baby. And how often in our last two, let's say two, three generations of women who had to be mom and dad mm -hmm. from the very beginning, and that sense of where we're comfortable enough to talk about being tapped out as moms, mm -hmm. how does that impact our children and their responsiveness, their emotionality, their sensitivity, and so usually in postpartum, we spend some point of time talking about really needed to protect that first six weeks postpartum so that mom has time alone, alone to recover, to rest, to breastfeed and bond. Even if she's not able, because there are plenty of reasons why women are not able, mm -hmm. their bodies are not able to, to produce milk. So I agree, like it's not one way. Mm -hmm. And I know many of us today are very pro breastfeeding and there are reasons, but let's not forget that there are many reasons why a woman can't. Mm -hmm. And I want to still honor and celebrate her. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> There's also, it's so individualized. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking of, um, well, there's a, a cousin cousin of mine who had her second child. And next thing you know, they're climbing mountains after mm -hmm. a week mm -hmm. or two weeks or, um, there's just so many other experiences that, again, what the team does and that inner innate knowing of that mom, me personally, I never felt better in my life after I gave birth, mm -hmm. especially my first one. They said, don't you need an aspirin or anything? And nope. <laughs> and nope, nope, nope. Mm -hmm. I felt I was shoveling snow. Yeah. Um, not right after, but I was, right. but just before. Right. So the notion of there's what well, we connote as postpartum being a negative. There's also the positive in terms of this is the best thing ever. And it, it jazzes so much. And so each person's individual recovery time yeah. can be downright miraculous. Yeah. And it's the it's more a we become, thing. the more we become informed, right? prenatally, mm -hmm. the better outcome we will have in our experience of birth and postpartum. Right. Because you're right. Not every 
birth leads to a hard recovery Correct. afterwards. Correct. Many moms will just bounce back. Many yep. moms are able to walk around mm-hmm. and have that same level of mobility as they did. Some moms are able to fit into their mom pants mm-hmm. or, or pre-pregnancy pants. That's right. 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 Um, everyone's story is so unique and different, but when we talk about the positivity of birth or of postpartum, um, my approach is really just bringing in the self-care routine, Mm -hmm. making sure that every day that she is able to put time into herself Mm -hmm. because we have learned in terms of the American society, uh, as mothers, we tend to put everybody else's needs before our own. Mm -hmm. And then we get to a point in time where we're resentful. That can definitely feel left out. My mother always says like, I was always the one taking pictures. Like I was never part of the pictures. And I have to honor that because how true that is even today. And I think there is beauty in social media is that we are feeling the desire to post more, to share more, to take more pictures Mm -hmm. than I think you guys did. And past, past generations, we had photography, but I think social media has brought that forward where we have the need to be a part of it. And there is this movement of womenhood who is like, get in front of the camera, mm-hmm. have somebody else, have the husband. And those are things we talk about in pre- prenatal is helping her be an active participant mm-hmm. in all of it. I've, I have a little funny yeah. story there was. So going back to the nineties and, and, um, Video cameras. <laughs> yeah. Video cameras were relatively new. And so I know of a woman that said, give me this camera. And so she was filming her own birth. That's amazing. Was, oh my, from her angle. Talk her about angle. Yeah, I'd like to see that, that video. Was hilarious. <laughs> but the cameras were, were big, almost like sure. TV. It was like TV crew. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's sort of come to a full circle a okay. little bit. And... Um, what is your, I think you've talked about your greatest joy, but what is your greatest joy and your greatest goal? And is there, do you foresee that you're going to be doula or are you morphing into something a little bit different? I I'm love morphing. that you're, we're all morphing into a lot of other things, <laughs> but that whole, the aspiration, aspired mother, that is your business name. Yeah. So share more about that. Mm. Um. Well, I'm an Aquarius and I've always been told I'm visionary mm-hmm. and I'm really great at advocating for something that's bigger than myself. Mm-hmm. So I started a business league of doulas called the Doulas Care Collective. That is another joy of mine. Um, I like talking about us versus me. Mm-hmm. And the, the we factor, the we factor. We. and there's no them because yeah. we're all one. Yeah. But th- so and the we unity and the community bringing the community together. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a business coach years ago who always said like, you may be in business for yourself, but not by yourself. Mm-hmm. And as doulas, we are women who support women, but as mothers too, we're not always the best at supporting ourselves. So I wanted to bring that I think about my mother's journey Mm -hmm. and being a single mother for many years. I think about my sister who has passed and her journey as a single mother. And I lead with that. That is my why. Mm -hmm. Because I saw two women who were everything to me do everything they could to navigate motherhood with such adversity too. And seeing how important even through my sister's passing, it is to bring women together and to support women. And so in terms of where am I going, I don't always know how to answer that Mm -hmm. because where I am today was not where I thought I was going in my 20s. And I like that. I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm an Aquarius, but I am a wanderer. I wander. I'm curious. I'm a deep thinker. Um, I came into birth work thinking I was going to stay in death work. I came into this. Had you been a death doula earlier? I was playing with it. Okay. I started um, volunteering at a local. That, that is definitely a whole thing. The, the hospice work and then beyond hospice yeah. as the escort, as yes. someone is leaving this planet. Mm-hmm. We'll save that for a whole nother show. But yes, yes. I'm very curious And both of which is a that. birth. You're just birthing into the next life. 
Birthing and into this, this life and birthing after mm-hmm. yeah. into the another life. Yeah, that's where, I mean, that's kind of my introductory to birth work was through death work. Okay. When I went through it with my sister and just learning how to hold space and the hospice nurse, um, when my sister was transitioning, it was the hospice nurse, myself, and my sister's best friend, who was a massage therapist, held space for her, did energy work on her. And that, that sensation, it, it there's no words to describe right. transition in both sides, birth and death, very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you can feel that as an energy worker, you can't deny mm-hmm. something far greater than what we're experiencing here on earth. Yep. Um, and I bring her into this journey with me. She's always leading me. Um, And I sometimes call out to her in my births, like bring that love and that healing energy and bring that baby forward as calm and gentle and whole as possible. Um, But yeah, so when I was, when I I experienced my sister's loss and the hospice nurse says, you have something, you need to do something with it. I was like, great, I'm a coach. And then when I came home and recovering and going through grief myself, I've never experienced sorrow like I did in that journey. Um, I started every client after that for those first six months after she died was also grieving loss, death. And I had a very hard time holding space for them when I was really going through it myself for the first time. And knowing in the back of my head, that hospice nurse, like in that moment, really leaving me with that like whisper, that call that there was something more that I needed to do with my connection. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I got into death work down here, vigil work. Um, I liked it, but I was still grieving. And my mom said, listen, I remember years ago when my sister gave birth, I was her birth partner and I loved it. Mm -hmm. There was so much magic of women coming together and initiating birth. It was just so magical, even in that very clinical sense back then. Um, and she just kind of gave me that permission to explore, be open to exploring birth again. And that brought forth so much healing because of my own miscarriages and whatnot. But through that journey of healing and doing Akashic Records, I always got up the note, the, um, what came forward was always a psycho, a psycho, psychopomp, psychotomp, psychopomp, I think it is. And it is the gatekeeper. I feel very much in my place when I'm keeping and I'm that gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. So being a keeper of birth and a keeper of death just seems so authentically like my calling in life. I've never felt such certainty and confidence as I do when I'm in that space protecting. And assisting. And, and you, you mentioned about the wholeness. Mm-hmm. We can go out in a gentle wholeness yeah. and come in Very much. with a gentle wholeness. Wow. We could keep talking for a long time, but right now I'm going to just say once again, thank you so much from, for sharing your spirit and your knowledge and, and your inspiration. Mm-hmm. Because I think some of the key words that you were saying is um, aspired, mm-hmm. knowledgeable, mm-hmm. and strong, courageous. Mm-hmm. And we all have these capabilities. And there are people out there to talk to and to consult with, to offer informed decisions. And uh, whatever the path is going to be, you get to choose. You get to choose. You get to be an active participant. An active participant, that's right. Because then again, we have to totally surrender. (laughs) We'll leave it at that. And there's nothing like giving birth than literally surrendering. Very much. Right. And dying. And dying. It's total surrender. And in birth is also a death. That's right. Death of your old self. Mm -hmm. And rebirthing into a mother, um, a new part of yourself. That's right. Chapter of your journey. And we'll leave it at that. Here's yeah. to the rebirth. Mm. Here's to the rebirth. Thank you so thank much you for so having much, me. Brooke. And thank you for listening. Please be sure to like, follow, review, and share this podcast. And if you'd like to be part of the conversation, send emails to podcasts at lastingconversations.com and follow us on Facebook. This is Lasting Conversations. We get to the heart of everything. <laughs>